ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for Dr. Robert Morris. tremendous treat we've had today. PODT came out and showed us a huge range of technologies that are here today. We can buy all those technologies today from PODT or one of their competitors, and we can start building this future. And then Mike just showed us the future. He showed us what we have to build towards and some of the amazing things that people are doing that entrepreneurs are doing, that small companies are doing, sometimes that large companies are doing, like bringing their people in to work together again and get better and better ideas. But you're sitting there thinking, I'm in my industry and my industry is being disrupted by all this technology and AI. What am I going to do? So what I hope to share with you today is the how. The how, how we use some of this technology. And if you'll forgive me, I'll go deep in a couple of places because I want to show you the amazing power. This technique and this technique of artificial intelligence and everything that we can do with data isn't just doing little things, automating things that we could do before and now we could do cheaper or maybe with, in a different way or a little faster. It's fundamentally changing and enabling our capabilities. I'll show you that in two industries healthcare and IoT, but the principles are the same in every single industry. So let's talk about how to build a cognitive business. So disruptions are coming from everywhere. The data, why is it happening now? Why has it only happened in the last 10 to 20 years? And it's obvious, right? For the first time, we have the data. The data's there on the internet, and we're connected because of mobility. So we finally have the data, and it's different types of data, every type of data. Second, we no longer have to build a big data center or buy special equipment. You can't actually buy an IBM Watson. You can get it from the cloud. You get it off the cloud, and in fact, you mix and match. If you've got a lot of your own ideas that you've built, or that data sitting in your existing facilities, you can combine it through APIs, application programming interfaces, so you can mix and match. This isn't just cheaper and faster and more flexible, it's faster. You can get there faster and compete more quickly. And what that is allowing you to do is completely transform industries, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. So first of all, what is this revolution that we call cognitive? Yes, many people call it AI, but we're talking about something that's a little bit bigger than what you might have heard of as AI. And I'm going to teach you a way of remembering what cognitive computing is today, and I guarantee you will never forget it. If I stop you in the corridor uh, tomorrow, at the conference tomorrow, I guarantee you'll be able to tell me exactly what cognitive computing is. And the reason is, since the dawn of the internet, every one of you has known the acronym URL. Go to this URL, go to that URL to buy new shoes. And in fact, there's a little mnemonic that will help you to remember what cognitive computing is. It's URL. Cognitive computing, cognitive systems are systems that you understand, they reason, and they learn. I guarantee you'll never forget that. Now, what does this mean, understanding? We had the data. I just talked about all the data that we have but that data comes in very diverse forms. For example, a lot of it is very unstructured. It's not numerical data in tables. It's unstructured, it's straight text. It's millions and millions of documents, very unstructured, that were written before the dawn of this era, some of them. We need to be able to understand that in context, right? And uh, we need to really, really be able to understand it the way a human is. If I use an expression like, I've just, had a I've just gotten a haircut, and this doesn't apply to me personally. It, it could mean a couple of things. It could mean I've just been to the barber shop, or it could mean I just lost a lot of money on the stock market. So how do you figure that out? How do you figure that out? By really understanding the document. Second, once we get this data, once we get this information, 
We have to reason with the data. What is reasoning? What does human do to reason? They interpret data, they, they, they think about their education, their life's experience, and they reason, they form little hypotheses. Maybe this person's doing this, or maybe my competitor's going to do that. We reason, we test hypotheses. New data causes us to change those hypotheses. We reason, but above all, cognitive systems, just like humans, learn. Every time new data comes in, every time we open the newspaper, every time we see a new feed of data from one of our data supplies, we learn, we change our opinions, we change our strategies. So remember, understand, reason, and learn. And once we do that, we can interact with systems and humans in a completely new way. Now, Mike did a very good job of explaining to you and dispelling the myth that these robots and AI systems are going to take away our jobs. Of course, they're not going to do that. They're going to change the law office, just as he explained. But they're also going to allow those many professions and industries to expand in ways that I'll show you that actually will create incredible expansion and growth and ability of our industries to serve human needs. And I'll show you examples of that. Humans will still be needed because humans have incredible capability that it'll take a long time. And I tell you, I work, I do research in this field. Take a long time to match. The purpose, why are we doing this? What problem are we trying to solve? What is our dream? What is our goal? What is beauty? What is, what is common sense? No, it doesn't make sense. You're telling me this, but no, 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 it doesn't make sense. That's a human capability, and it'll take a long time for systems to be able to do that. But humans can do amazing things today. They can absorb incredible amounts of information. They can find patterns. They never forget. They can do, they can reason without bias. We all have incredible set of biases that, we, that affect our reasoning. Machines and data can help us to escape that bias. And so ultimately, when we put cognitive systems together with man, we can do far more than either man can do or machine can do. How, what's, the, what's the biggest effect that's going to make it easy for you to overcome that fear you have of transforming your industry and doing it in a way that differentiates yourselves and gives you a competitive advantage? The biggest new thing that I can tell you is the democratization of AI. AI is available for everyone very easily today, and the reason is most of it is residing on the cloud, most of it is residing not only in big, expensive pieces, but in tiny little pieces called microservices that are accessible through simple calls that you can get specific functions that you can use to start small with AI in your enterprise, but over time build an incredibly powerful machine that enables you to understand, reason, and learn. And I've just shown a collection of those functions that are available. IBM has a system uh, called Watson that you've heard about, which is very powerful, but it's completely democratized, meaning all the functions are available in little bite-sized pieces. For example, there's a tone analyzer. You put any text into that tone, and it analyzes your personality, what you're trying to do, what your motivation might be, and actually it's amazing in its ability with a few paragraphs of writing to really say what kind of a person you are and how you're thinking. Uh, question answering. Uh, it can ask, you can ask questions about a variety of things, and from the data that you've given it, whether it's uh, a few volumes of data or hundreds of thousands of documents, it can give you very, very good answers from that data. There are many such functions available as microservices from vendors like IBM. We think Watson is the most complete set, but decide for yourself. You can look at sets of these APIs from different vendors in cognitive computing and start trying them, start building them. So now I'm going to go off script. What I just gave you was the way IBM always talks about artificial intelligence and cognitive systems. But I'm a research guy, okay? I sit in the lab, we hack things, we try to do things that have never been done before. And in fact, doing that through a series of grand challenges actually got us into AI, and I have to say that we were one of the first. We, not, not having the data in the past, and not even knowing what problem we were trying to solve, we decided to play games. And in 1954, we built a chess, uh, sorry, a drafts playing machine 
that could play drafts or checkers extremely well. And in 1994, we built a backgammon playing machine. This backgammon playing system was very interesting because we never taught it how to play backgammon. We initiated it with a completely random strategy and then we had it play against itself until it learned a good strategy for playing backgammon. And, in the, and it became a world-class player. But in the process, it, for example, always played openings in a certain way, whereas all the world champions of backgammon always played openings in a different way. A couple of years later, all the world tournament champions realized that these openings in IBM's TD Gammon was superior and it changed the world of backgammon playing. At that point, we, up to this point, we were interested in experimenting with games as grand challenges. Again, we didn't have the internet, the full power of it, and we didn't have all the data to solve really interesting problems. And then we went on to chess. This was actually my project. And in 1997, we played the world champion of chess called Garry Kasparov, and the machine was able to beat him. And the reason, something very instructive, the machine was able to have a complete model of the world, which was the chess board and illegal moves. And then it went through a process of generating and testing moves down a tree until it found a good position. It also had to learn an evaluation function since it couldn't play through all the way to the end. So it had to know if it went down 10 moves, did it leave the board in a good position or a not so good position? That thinking, which I'm going to come back to in the context of healthcare and IoT, is profound. And it gives a huge introduction into some of the most powerful ways that we can solve hard problems. And then in 2011, we'd been working on this for five years, we set ourselves another grand challenge. Could we build a machine that could answer questions better than any human being on the planet? And what the way we tested that, we, so we could have a test, pass or fail, we decided to play the game show, which many of you would have seen. It's very popular in the United States, but it's also licensed in many countries around the world called Jeopardy. It's a very hard quiz show. I can answer hardly any of the questions. They're about history, geography, medicine, science, movie trivia, politics, world geography, etc. And in fact, we were able to build a machine which, after we loaded about 10,000 books of information in, was able to figure out the answers to those Jeopardy questions and beat the two world champion players who are shown on the screen. How about that? A machine that can answer questions from you know, a large amount of data, but can answer questions better than anyone in the world. But you know what was the most interesting thing about Jeopardy? And that test, that Jeopardy challenge, which was played by the Watson system, it was where we made mistakes. And I'm going to tell you a very profound mistake that we made. In one of the final games of Jeopardy, there was a question, and the question was the following. It was in a topic called US cities. And the question was, what US city has its airport that's named after a World War II hero and its second airport that's named after a World War II battle? Does anyone know the answer? It, Chicago. Right, someone said Chicago. The airport is O'Hare Airport, the second airport is Midway Airport. You know what Jeopardy answered? Toronto. Toronto is not even a US city. And I was talking to the uh, leader of the Jeopardy, the Watson team afterwards, and Dave Ferrucci, and I said, how could that happen? And he said, well, of course, we don't keep a list of US cities. We figure it all out from the documentation. So, let me tell you how that drove us to a complete change in AI. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about cancer. When we got through playing games, we said, we're, we've, we've playing games, we've been the best in the world in chess and in question answering. We're through playing games. We're gonna do something very important. Let's build a machine that can cure cancer. And that machine is out there today. It's called Watson Oncology. It's in 55 hospital systems around the world. 55 hospital systems, many more hospitals. And the way it works is the following. Now, first of all, we cannot have any Torontos in the case of cancer. People's lives depend 
on what this system is going to say. It supplements a doctor, but it cannot, it cannot mislead a doctor, okay? So what it does, it digests all the information about that patient in very unstructured form, and then it looks at a, a fixed, agreed-to set of guidelines, the most complete set of guidelines in the world, are called the NCCN guidelines. I won't tell you more about it, but it's a very comprehensive set of guidelines, which is basically a decision tree. It says for this type of breast cancer, do this test, do this test, then do this, and if that fails, do this, and if that fails, do this, etc., etc. right? Typical guidelines in medicine. It takes those, and it comes up with some recommendations. That's not very brilliant, right? I mean, a good computer science student could write a program that ingested this information, uh, maybe not so easy if you realize it's natural language, and then follow this, this decision tree. But then it gets interesting, because the answer is those guidelines are not good enough to deal with something called the Asian genotype. Actually, Asians respond differently in lung cancer than the Western population for which the NCCN guidelines were written. So then Watson reads the entire medical literature for extra information. It reads 27 million abstracts in the PubMed database, all the medical literature in the world, and it looks for other evidence. It says, ah, Asian phenotype, this particular gene mutation, this particular family history, this age, this comorbidity. And it also then starts looking at other guidelines from famous healthcare systems around the world. It pulls all that together, and it doesn't tell the doctor, do this, it says, yes, here are the guidelines, but you may want to consider this in paper, which showed that a patient very similar to yours was successfully treated this way or was not successfully treated. When you get through with this, you get an incredibly powerful system, and at the bottom of that chart, in case anyone is interested, and I know there are people here in the audience that are involved in healthcare systems, we recently did a test and we published it a couple of weeks ago at the top cancer conference in the world called ASCO. And what we did is we tested Watson for five different cancers against the tumor boards. These are the committees of the top professors that sit in the best, some of the best hospitals in the world where they meet and they discuss a patient's tumor and decide what the best course of action is. We tested this against them and we obtained roughly 90% agreement with these tumor boards. Now, you could say 90% 90 agreement, and by the way, doesn't necessarily mean the tumor board was always right and Watson was wrong, or not as, not as clever. It could be the other way around, right? You say, well, you know, what's the good of that if it's agreeing with the tumor board? Well, most people in the world don't have a tumor board to go to. In India, with a population of over a billion people, you have less than 1,000 oncologists. Most people have their cancer not treated by a tumor board, but by a general doctor, if they're lucky, who, who, who's never even studied oncology. So now that this is rolled out in India, and by the way, could be rolled out in the Philippines, you imagine the power of this. It's not putting doctors out of business. It's supplementing them. It's giving them an incredibly powerful weapon. So if I go in with a particular type of lung cancer, which most doctors have never seen before, it knows. It's been to the literature and it knows. I want to touch one other area. You can see the depth and the power of this. I want to touch one other area. But before I do that, I want to go back to URL, understand, reason, learn. And I want to put it in a little bit busy diagram here, but think about learn as forming a model of the world or the system that you're trying to, trying to manage. Now we're getting into the domain of IoT, Internet of Things, managing the real world, okay? You want to form a model. That's called learn in the middle of that diagram. Learn, form a body of knowledge. What does that learn consist of? It could consist of 27 million papers. That's the body of knowledge in human medicine. 27 million unstructured papers, that's the model. Sorry, there's nothing better. Or it could, be, it could be a state space model in a power system. We're trying to control a power system or a set of manufacturing machines, such as was shown earlier today. And what do we do? We start with, at the bottom, the real world system. We get data, we get observations, and we form a conceptual or a mathematical model or a collection of data that represents that system. And then what does artificial intelligence do? It's just like chess. 
It's just like chess. You think about a number of different moves and you test them and you say, will they be good or will they be bad? So now for that system, you start running through scenarios. What if I do this? That's the top box, it's called reason. In artificial intelligence, it's called generate an idea and test it. Of course you can't run it through the real world system. That's the patient. You run it through the model. And you say, will that make the patient better or worse? And you keep iterating like this. I just showed it to you in healthcare. Let me show you another example. You all know how bad the air quality is in China. And it's bad in a lot of other countries, and it can get pretty bad in the Philippines as well. Here's an example of an IoT, Internet of Things system, which has lowered the particulate count in the air in Beijing by 30% in the last couple of years. This system impacts 200, is installed now across China. It was built by IBM for the Chinese government. It impacts 250 million people and their lives. And the way it works is, why is it IoT? Because it's sensors. It's 4,000 sensors and a bunch of satellites looking at the weather, right? and also a list of polluting sites, like factories and roads and so on. So what it does is it learns the dynamics of how pollution spreads. It has the weather company, which some of you might have seen outside at our booth. It uses the weather company to model winds and clouds and how things drift. It uses chemical models to model how chemical agents transition and react once they get into the air. And then it uses an artificial intelligence technique which you might have heard about called blending. Blending, bagging, boosting, which is all the models which disagree with one another, which was why the Chinese government was stuck and needed our help. Use artificial intelligence to blend them together and select for when they work and then when they don't work. That's your model. It's actually built from over 100 models, correctly combined using artificial intelligence techniques. But what do you do? Okay, so you can predict the air pollution 72 hours in advance. What do you do about it? The only thing you can do is shutdowns. So you take coal-burning plants, shut them down, and import the electricity instead from Mongolia. It costs a little bit more, but it fixes the air. So the Chinese government every day makes a decision what to shut down in terms of coal-burning plants, what blast furnaces and manufacturing to shut down, what quarries, whether to take the cars off the road for an extra day or week based on their number plates, all these interventions. And, of course, because of the weather models, it doesn't shut down coal-burning power stations that are downwind. That's no use. That's throwing people out of work for no benefit of the city. It shuts down coal-burning stations that are upwind. So it minimizes the economic impact while improving the air quality. This is now being deployed in five other countries around the world. It's going to become a standard. It was IoT, it's artificial intelligence, it's going deep in an industry, and by the way, it can also be used in alternative energy generation, in energy conservation, and many of the things that you're interested in. I've shown you two examples, okay? I want to close here on one idea. Toronto, okay? Everyone today is talking about deep learning. And in fact, it's all available. It's available on, on the Watson calls. You can plug your data and do a deep learning, do a model of the sales in your industry or the success of your marketing plan or something else. Those algorithms are available. But the advanced AI and the one that you may want to consider to transform your industry should also think about a model of the system that you're trying to manage. It should think about a model of your population of people who buy your products. It should think about a model of perhaps the power station that you're trying to control. Uh, it should think about a model of your electricity grid that you're trying to control. It should think about a model of your insurance clients or your financial clients or your supply chain. And so if you think about these things, of course, use procedural, use big data on the left or expert systems, use learning systems, use, use deep learning, but also think about reasoning with real world knowledge and you have a tremendous opportunity to transform your industry, to be ahead, to get all the benefits out of AI. And so with that, I'll leave you with the question, what are you going to do for your industry, whether it be education, government, industrial, financial services, all of them equally applicable and ready to be transformed. 
What will you do with artificial intelligence and systems like Watson? So with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Robert Morris.